the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, delegations from the International Monetary Fund led by its director of the Asia Pacific Department arrive in Colombo today to meet with President Anurag Kumar at the Sanayaka. Creating a unique landmark in the Sri Lankan tourism sector, the total number of arrivals surpassed the entire number of visitors recorded in 2023. The bullish sentiment at the Colombo Stock Exchange seems to be waning despite a strong start to the week, with both the ASPI and the S&P SL20 ending the trading day with losses. And most US stocks slump, though defense and oil sees gains reacting to the intensifying conflict in the Middle East. From Studio 24, here's Anuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A high-level team of the International Monetary Fund led by its director of the Asia Pacific Department, Krishna Srivarsasam, arrived in Colombo today to meet with President Anurag Kumar Desanayake and Sri Lanka's new economic team. The delegation will stay in the country until Friday to discuss latest economic developments and economic reforms under Sri Lanka's economic program supported by the IMF, according to a spokesperson for the global lender. Speaking on the visit of the high-level delegation, cabinet spokesman Vijay Theherat said that only preliminary discussions on the country's EFF program will take place during the meeting. A further discussion on its structural facts is scheduled to take place in New York around the end of October. Sri Lanka's IMF program is reviewed every 6 months based on how the quantity targets and reforms are reached. On a related note, His Excellency Mizuko Shihideaki, the ambassador of Japan to Sri Lanka, visited the president today at the presidential secretariat. During their cordial meeting, Ambassador Mizuko Shi extended his heartfelt congratulations to the president on his recent election victory. Creating a unique landmark in the Sri Lankan tourism sector, the total number of arrivals by October 1st, 2024, surpassed the entire number of visitors recorded in 2023, which was 1,487,303. From September 1st to the 29th of this year, Sri Lanka attracted a total of 1,480,678 people and with a daily average arrival mark of around 4,000 per day, the country passed last year's total number. Sri Lanka recorded 118,000 tourist arrivals from the 1st of September, marinating the 100,000 plus arrival mark every month in 2024. The best month was in February of this year where Sri Lanka attracted 218,350 arrivals, registering a 102.8% growth over 2023 February, which had 107,639 visitors. With peaceful elections and the reintroduction of the ETA visa system as against the controversial VFS visa system and also free visa on arrival for seven countries, Sri Lanka tourism expects to mark 2024 as the best year for tourism, overrunning the 2,333,796 arrival mark which was registered in 2018. The new government in their manifesto is looking at increasing the yearly arrival mark to around 4 million tourists per year in the future. Sri Lanka's banking sector saw a continued improvement in non-performing loan ratios during the second quarter of 2024. The NPL rate decreased from 12.8% from 13% in the previous quarter, indicating a gradual decline in default risk, according to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Accordingly, the NPL loans declined to 1,402.6 billion rupees, recording a 1.4% decrease on a year-on-year -year basis. Total gross loans and receivables stood at 11,081.9 billion rupees, while provisions for NPLs amounted to 729.3 billion rupees. Despite an overall improvement, certain sectors such as tourism experienced a slight increase in NPLs to 40%, and the transportation industry stayed around 30% in the first two. quarters the banking sector's profitability improved significantly with a profit after tax of 101.8 billion rupees up 38.8% year on year this was primarily driven by a surge in net interest income which increased to 395 billion rupees from 188 billion rupees in the first quarter meanwhile gross income stood at 491 billion at the end of the first half of the year the sector's liquidity position also strengthened with both the liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio 
ratio showing significant improvements compared to the previous year, where the liquidity coverage ratio in rupees stood at 340%. Global shipping line Sea Lead Shipping has launched a weekly direct line of service with the Sri Lanka Ports Authority, which increases maritime connectivity between the Far East, India and East Africa through its Far East India Chipoti service. Sea Lead said in a statement outlining the advantages of the FID service that by providing direct connections between China, India, Djibouti, the service is set to reduce transit times and boost trade efficiency across major global trade routes, especially with the inclusion of Colombo as a key hub port. SLPA said in a statement that the FID service, which commenced operations on the 5th of last month, provides weekly liner services connecting vital ports to China, India and Djibouti. The westbound route starts in Shanghai and includes stops at Ningbo, Nansha, Port Klang, Colombo, Navasheva and Mundra, culminating in Djibouti. The return eastbound journey links Djibouti directly back to Shanghai, streamlining trade across these critical regions. SLPA Managing Director Prabhat Malavige said this partnership with Sea Lead aligns with their ongoing commitment to strengthen Colombo's status as a premier maritime hub in the region. Let's take a short commercial break. Market updates on the other side. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The bullish sentiment at the Colombo Stock Exchange seems to be waning despite a strong start to the week with both the ASPI and S&P SL20 ending the trading day with losses. Despite the decline, the sentiment remains hopeful in seeing the numbers go back in the green. For an update on how the CSE performed today, we have with us Netmi Fernando from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. The broad market failed to sustain 11 consecutive sessions of gains during the day as selling pressure and profit-taking emerged upon the majority of the sectors. The ASPI opened the day on a negative note but rebounded instantly, reaching an intraday high of 12,035 points. However, towards midday, selling pressure and profit-taking emerged. Despite this downturn, the index recovered gradually and closed the session in red at 11,934 points, down by 59 points. Notably, the banking sector experienced a mixed sentiment throughout the day. Amidst mixed participation from retail and high net worth investors, turnover stood at LKR 2.3 billion, marking a 31.4% decrease from the monthly average, standing at LKR 1.7 billion. Additionally, 75% of the four off-board transactions which were recorded during the day were dominated by the banking sector, namely Sampath Bank, Commercial Bank and Nations Trust Bank. The banking sector solely contributed 59% to the overall turnover, whilst the capital goods and food beverage and tobacco sectors jointly contributed 18% to the overall turnover. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka held its weekly bill auction today, with strong sentiment of cutting rates beforehand. To get an understanding on how these auctions will impact the secondary market, we have with us Ranjan Ranthunga from First Capital Holdings. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka conducted its weekly treasury bill auction today and raised the total offered of LKR 142.5 billion. The majority of the accepted was from the three months and the six months maturities, where LKR 72.5 billion was raised from the 3 months maturity, while LKR 67.5 billion was raised from the 6 months maturity. However, the 12 month bill was under undersubscribed as CBS had accepted LKR 2.9 billion rupees from the auction. Meanwhile, continuing from the previous week, the weighted average yields continue to edge down across the board, where the 3 months maturity saw the steepest decline by 43 BPS to 10.06% while the 6 months is down by 35 BPS to 10.37 and the 12 month bill is down by 1 BPS to 10.04. The continued decline in yields was primarily driven by the newfound clarity in the political arena. Moreover, the continuous improvement in CCPI inflation 
which recorded deflation of 0.5% for September, also offered support for the investor sentiment. The decline in prices was mainly driven by the both food and non-food categories, which recorded disinflation of 0.3% and 0.5% respectively for September 2024. Gold prices eased today as the dollar held firm, while investors looked for more US economic data for further cues on upcoming rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. Spot gold was down 0.5% at $2,649.17 per ounce. U.S. gold futures is 0.7% to $2,670.30. A stronger dollar makes greenback price bullion more expensive for other currency holders. Trading volumes for gold were thin as China and India were closed for holidays. Market participants will now monitor ADP employment data and remarks from Fed officials later in the day, along with ISMM services data and non-farm payrolls due later this week. Traders see a 65% chance of a 25 basis point Fed cut in November and a 35% chance of a 50 basis point cut. Oil prices climbed more than 2% today on rising concerns that Middle East tensions could escalate, potentially disrupting crude output from the region, following Iran's biggest ever military blow against Israel. Brent futures leapt 2.2% to $75.19 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude spiked 2.4% to $71.53. WTI had earlier risen more than $2. Both crude benchmarks yesterday surged more than 5% before closing around 2.5% higher. A panel of ministers from OPEC Plus, which includes Russia, meets later today to review the market, with no policy change expected. The group is set to raise output from December by 180,000 BPD monthly. The selling rate of the US dollar has dipped below 300 rupees today, marking the first drop since the 8th of June 2023. According to the Commercial Bank, the buying rate for the US dollar have decreased from 290 rupees and 58 cents to 289 rupees and 09 cents, while the selling rates have fallen from 300 rupees and 25 cents to 298 rupees and 75 cents. Now we'll look at the Sri Lankan rupees performance against other global currencies. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Digital Health, a subsidiary of Dialog Axiata PLC, Sri Lanka's number one connectivity provider, introduced Sri Lanka's first AI-powered health scan, revolutionizing how consumers manage their well-being. This innovative feature enables users to monitor vital health indicators such as blood pressure, heart rate, heart rate variability and stress levels directly from their smartphones or devices. The introduction of AI-powered health scans is poised to transform Sri Lanka's healthcare landscape, aligning seamlessly with Doc990's long-term goal of bringing health at your fingertips to every Sri Lankan. The technology allows users to effortlessly monitor vital health metrics, making health management more accessible and immediate. By empowering individuals with real-time health data, the AI scan not only promotes preventative care, but also democratizes healthcare, ensuring that cutting-edge technology is within reach for all. This innovation further reinforces Doc990's commitment to integrating advanced digital health solutions into everyday life, bringing the future of health directly into the hands of every Sri Lankan. Beyond individual use, the feature holds significant potential for corporate applications, including employee wellness and insurance services, setting a new standard for health management in Sri Lanka.
In line with Dialog's vision of the future today, digital health continues to lead in introducing advanced healthcare solutions to the market. The AI-powered health scan is now available on the Doc990 app, offering a glimpse into the future of healthcare, where technology empowers consumers like never before. The Board of Directors of Union Bank of Colombo PLC has unanimously resolved to appoint Dinesh Virakadi as its chairman. The decision was made after Nirvana Chaudhary informed the bank regarding his decision to step down as the chairman of Union Bank of Colombo due to his ongoing commitments in Nepal. Chaudhary will continue as a director of the bank. Vera Kodi was an independent non-executive director of the bank before this. He is a former chairman of both Commercial Bank of Ceylon and Hatton National Bank and has also served on the board of DFCC Bank. He is a director of several companies and the chairman of the Employers Federation of Ceylon. He has held senior leadership roles in the public sector as well. IT Gallery Private Limited has introduced the latest collection of Lenovo commercial and consumer products to the local market, including cutting-edge products from the ThinkPad and Yoga Device lines. Since 2011, IT Gallery Computers Private Limited, which has established itself as a leading brand in the country's information technology distribution market, introduced the Lenovo laptops, one of the most prestigious global tech brands, to the Sri Lankan market. Among these latest products are the high-quality and easily portable ThinkPad P16 Gen 2 workstation and the ThinkPad X1 Carbon, which has become a popular choice among business professionals, including the Yoga Slim 7X Copilot Plus PC, Yoga Slim 7i Core Ultra, and the multifunctional Yoga 7 2-in-1 and the gaming powerhouse Legion 5i. This comprehensive and innovative product lineup is expected to revolutionize the technology technology market, bringing in a new wave of technological advancements and elevating the user experience to new heights. Colombo West International Terminal has made another crucial advance towards becoming one of Asia's leading port facilities with the delivery of its first two semi-automated rail-mounted quay cranes and three additional fully automated cantilever rail-mounted granite cranes. This shipment marks the second in a series of deliveries as the terminal gears up for Phase 1 operations in February of 2025. In total, CWIT will have nine cranes operational before the terminal officially begins handling cargo next year. These state-of-the-art automated cranes are designed to improve efficiency and enhance safety by reducing human intervention and increasing operational precision. CWIT's phase development plan will see the terminal equipped with 30 fully automated CRMGs and 14 semi-automated RMQCs, with its final completion making it a cornerstone in the expansion of Sri Lanka's port sector. The terminal's advanced infrastructure and technology will significantly increase container handling capacity at POC, enabling it to keep pace with global growing trade demands. The substantial investment and capacity enhancement of CWIT will elevate Port of Colombo's position in terms of output and connectivity. Once fully operated, Operational CWIT will play a pivotal role in fueling economic growth, providing much-needed capacity to accommodate mega-vessels and increasing regional trade. WIS Accountancy, a leading provider of digital accountancy, bookkeeping, tax and business advisory services in UK, is expanding its operations in both the UK and Sri Lanka. WIS Accountancy is part of the one-stop finance shop, the WIS Group of Companies, which also comprises WIS Umbrella, WIS Mortgages and Insurance and WIS Wealth. This year, they launched a revolutionary mortgage platform called Morgats in the UK, which leverages AI to transform the mortgage journey from customers, advisors and lenders. This cutting-edge development is predominantly managed offshore in Colombo and India, where its talented team creates tools to make the mortgage process efficient, secure and user-friendly, redefining the future of mortgages.
Marking a significant advancement in Sri Lanka's digital payment ecosystem, iPay, Sri Lanka's leading digital payment solution has integrated with Just Pay Web, a cutting-edge online payment platform developed by Lanka Pay. Accordingly, the NPL loans declined to 1,402.6 billion rupees, recording a 1.4% decrease on a year-on-year -year basis. Total gross loans and receivables stood at 11,081.9 billion rupees, while provisions for NPLs amounted to 729.3 billion rupees. Despite an overall improvement, certain sectors such as tourism experienced a slight increase in NPLs to 40%, and the transportation industry stayed around 30% in the first two quarters. The banking sector's profitability improved significantly with a profit after tax of 101.8 billion rupees, up 38.8 percent year on year. This was primarily driven by a surge in net interest income, which increased to 395 billion rupees from 188 billion rupees in the first quarter. Meanwhile, gross income stood at 491 billion at the end of the first half of the year. The sector's liquidity position also strengthened, with both the liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio showing significant improvements compared to the previous year, where the liquidity coverage ratio in rupees stood at 340%. Going in for a short commercial break now, we'll be right back with Global Updates. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. More stocks held firm today, while oil prices and some safe haven assets rose, suggesting that the market impact of escalating Middle East tensions has been contained for now. Europe's benchmark stocks index rose 0.24% and MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares climbed 1.23%, despite fears of a wider conflict following Iran's ballistic missile strike on Israel. The safe haven dollar traded close to its strongest in three weeks versus the euro. Macroeconomics also buoyed the dollar, with a resilient US job market arguing for a smaller Federal Reserve interest rate cut in November and Eurozone inflation trends backing a European Central Bank easing this month. Mainland Chinese markets were shut for the Golden Week holiday. Over in the US, more stocks slumped. Though some stocks like defense and oil rose reacting to the intensifying conflict in the Middle East. Wall Street's main indexes ended lower on Tuesday as investors exercised caution amid strife in the Middle East. The Dow dropped four-tenths of a percent, the S&P 500 shed nearly a percent, and the Nasdaq lost one and a half percent. Iran on Tuesday launched a salvo of ballistic missiles in retaliation for Israel's campaign against Tehran's Hezbollah allies. Data released on Tuesday showed U.S. job openings rebounded in August, while another report showed manufacturing activity continued to contract in September. Traders slightly increased odds to just under 40 percent that the Fed will cut interest rates by another 50 basis points in November, according to CME's FedWatch tool. While markets may be Fed-focused, some stocks reacted to the intensifying conflict in the Middle East. Shares of ExxonMobil rose more than 2 percent as oil prices jumped on supply concerns. Defense stocks also rose, with Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin helping to push the S&P 500 Aerospace and Defense Index to a record high. And airline shares fell, including Delta, which closed down more than 1.5 percent. Lufthansa is aiming to revive its Koya line by 2026, as one of Europe's top carriers struggles more than its regional rivals with higher costs and prolonged delays in Boeing plane deliveries. Its chief executive reported this. Lufthansa wants to revive its core airline by 2026. That was the vow from the airline group's chief executive Carsten Spohr late Monday. Lufthansa is one of Europe's top carriers but has struggled more than its regional rivals with higher costs and delays in Boeing plane deliveries. Spohr described the Lufthansa airline as the German group's problem child and said it must be turned around for the wider company's success. He said the goal was to make Lufthansa the group's flagship once again for its 100th birthday in two years. The comment comes as investors worry about the group's third quarter results due later this month. 
Shares have fallen 10% over the last six months and Lufthansa has issued two profit warnings this year. The carrier has faced spiralling wage costs, a squeeze on ticket prices and a tough aviation market. Spohr said the delayed delivery of new jets had made ongoing issues worse and hit Lufthansa disproportionately hard. Lufthansa is still waiting for 41 new Boeing planes to arrive, with the jets on order already facing years-long delays. Spohr said it forced the airline to keep using older Airbus planes the group had hoped to retire before the pandemic. He added it hurt Lufthansa's ability to expand services on profitable routes and boost efficiency as newer planes use less jet fuel. Other European airlines like Ryanair have also been hurt by Boeing's long delivery delays. And that's all from us here at the Nightly Business Report. Join us again tomorrow for more key updates across the business globe. Until then, I'm Sonia Mudan Thank you for watching. Good night.